Hey you guys, this is Raphael. I hope you're all doing well. I hope everything's going in your direction because you deserve it. And I think you deserve it because I've got faith in you and because you're cool enough to be watching this today. Today we're going to talk about one of the prettiest guns I've had in a long time. And it's actually a very rare gun. This one is often misidentified. A lot of people just call them an 1816 model musket. It's not. This one is the one that is technically known as the US Model 1840. The, which again, <laughs> doesn't make a lot of sense because the design was officially adopted in 1835. So a lot of times you'll hear them called 1835 models, 1840 models, or 1835 slash 40 models whatever they are, they're neat guns. They are, uh, actually they started out as flintlocks and it's the last flintlock that the US government accepted. The model uh, after this, they started using percussion guns instead of flintlocks. These guns were made three places, Springfield Armory and Springfield Mass. They were also made uh, by NIPS, N-I-P-P-E-S, and this one. This one was made in Pittsfield, Massachusetts by L. Pomeroy. And most always his guns will be marked L. Pomeroy because he was Lemuel, Lemuel. <laughs> we don't have that name down here very much, so I try to say it right. But like Raphael, most people mispronounce it. L-E-M-U-E-L, Lemuel uh, Pomeroy. And it'll have his marking and a real pretty Union Eagle in front of the hammer like this. Behind the hammer, we have the uh, US mark and the 1843 production date. These guns originally made as flint. They were taken back in later on and switched to percussion. Very few of them were done that way. They only made 7,000 of these at Pomeroy to begin with. So they took it back in. This one was converted to percussion, but what is extra, extra cool about it is that it was rifled. And we, there was only a handful of those done. We can tell it from a mile away because at the breech of the barrel, they've got this, the long range rear sight. That tells us right off the bat, rifled gun instead of a standard uh, smooth bore. These, when they came out of Splint, they were originally smooth bore, fired a smooth musket ball. These were designed to fire the rifled, what's often referred to as a mini ball uh, or a manet ball because they're named after the cat in France that came up, is credited with the original design. The, another quick way to tell that it's rifled, if you have this sight missing, you can tell by the ramrod. If the ramrod is original to the gun, see how it's cupped on the end? And that's to put on the top of the uh, 69 caliber bullet, because the bullet looked like this. This one is beautiful. Most of the guns that, that I sell are all I like them where they're heavily worn, where you can tell they saw the elephant. This one is one of those, it's a keeper. It's one of those that's in great shape. One to 10, it's gonna be a nine at least. It's got the full length barrel, original rear sight intact. Every marking at the breech you can see, it's got the, uh, the US, it's got the JH, and that JH stands for John Hawkins. He's the guy that approved the barrel so it could be used. Uh, he said it was good enough quality for the government to use. It's got the P, and this is called a sunken P, just because the die goes in and it looks like it's sunken around the letter P. This one has the production date of the barrel itself as 1842. And you see those dates where they don't always hit the exact same date because they take these into the arsenal. They're rifling them as long as it fits and as long as it works. They weren't looking at the date of then, because as in the past, they were looking at the day now to get this thing rifled, make it more deadly, make it more accurate, make it more the weapon that they wanted it to be. This one jumps out at you because of the quality of the metal and because of the quality of the stock. Look at that stock. I mean, it's just, it's beautiful. On the flat opposite of the lock plate, we have two cartouches. The first one is WAT, and that's one you see fairly often. That's William A. Thornton, and he approved the gun. And there's a second one that approved it as well, NWP, and you see his a lot too. That's Nahum Patch, N-A-H-U-M Patch. And he inspected a lot of pistols, uh, some muskets, quite a few things. Uh, 
The guns themselves, I only made them from 1840 to 1846. They made the 7,000 I was talking to you about. That's not many. So you gotta keep in mind, this is a rare gun to start with. These guns almost all got converted. So if you see one in original Flint, that's original. It's worth a lot of money because most of them, when they made these, they were almost obsolete by the time they made them. So they took them in and switched them over to the percussion. Uh, the original Flint, tough to find, and it, it can bring multiples of what these can bring. Uh, these guns were important, that Model 3540, whatever you want to call it, last flintlock that the U.S. government bought. Uh, another way to tell if it's a uh, 3540, the nose cap's different than the Model 1816, and that's the piece that's on the end of the gun that holds the stock onto the barrel. This one's beautiful. Go on the website. I took a lot of pictures of it because it's pretty. I like looking at it and I thought you might too. There's pictures from every angle. I try to give you every angle so when you buy something from me, you know what you're getting because I don't have time to do returns. So I figure if I show you every blemish, everything on a gun, you know exactly what you're getting and there's no surprises. And I appreciate you guys because it makes me feel good when I hear people say, that looks even better in the pictures. I appreciate you doing that for me. And I try. They, <laughs> that's what they're going to put on my tombstone. His DA tried. Um, it's actually in my will that that has to be put on my tombstone. I hope you guys are doing well. Hope everything's going your way. This one's going to be a nice, short, simple one. Um, I want you to take a chance and be kind to somebody that you... Uh, might not particularly care for. I was in a restaurant today and sometimes my trigger just slips and I said something to some rude people that I shouldn't have said. Uh, I, held, I pull up in the parking lot, my daughter and I are walking in, these people, they pull up and four of them jump out, they run and I didn't know their situation. I should have thought more about somebody else than me. But I hold the door for him. One of the four said thank you. Or, or I think he said thank you. He mumbled something that the optimist in me wanted to believe was thank you. And so we go in and the lady that works there comes up to see us. And of course, they jump in front of us. And I just called them something that I shouldn't have called them. It was not. <laughs> Sometimes I ought to just keep my mouth shut. But if you watch these videos, you know that's not easy and not optim. Uh, uh, doesn't happen all the time. And the guy turns around. He says, we didn't mean to cut in front of you. And I had my mask on and I grinned and went like that. But yeah, he did. And he was, they were the buttheads, but I was, I let them be a butthead, make me be a butthead. And so if they by chance happened to watch this video, I'm sorry that I was a butthead. I should not have gotten provoked, but we all do at times. But I ramble sometimes. I hope that we give folks the benefit of the doubt. They might've been having a bad day. And I was having a good day. And it chapped my butt. I just have, I've stewed on it all afternoon. And that ain't gonna do anybody any good in the world. And I don't wanna be that guy that lets stuff eat him up. I try to let it go. Uh, and I hope you do too. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Hold that door even if they don't say it because Somebody needs to be kind to somebody and you can make the difference. I love you guys and I'll catch you next time.